All right, this is a little bit of a follow-up from, uh, from last week, which is cool though, because it's, it's a hot topic right now around the dojo. Um, this looks like a long question, but it's not. So Michael says, or yeah, Michael, I'm wondering if anyone can explain the science behind, behind what we talked about last two weeks ago when we're talking about mouth blowing a reed for 16 beats of music to test for the correct strength. So what I do is I play one line of Scott and the Brave and what I have found is if I can just barely get to the end of that line, no further, but I don't die before then, right? That's the correct strength read for me. Uh, and by the way, that's going to be, you know, slightly different for everyone. What Carl can blow for 16 beats will be slightly different than what I can, okay? Because we have different strengths and weaknesses. Now, what Michael is asking is he understands that this works, blah, blah, blah. But like, what's the science behind it? And, and it's a good question. Shouldn't the physical strength of your arm squeezing be considered more than your lungs? Uh, uh, that's a good question. And so he's just kind of wanting some follow-up information. First of all, um, so the um, mouth blowing test, okay, covers three main areas, three out of the four maybe, right? It covers three out of the four areas, which are your lip strength, okay? The strength of your lips to grip your blowpipe or your reed, okay, is extremely important and uh, extremely relevant to how hard of a reed you're ultimately going to be able to blow. So mouth blowing will test that because we're using our mouth right on the reed. Second thing would be, you know, uh, your lung volume, like how much volume you have in your lungs, like the amount of air that you can push into the bag is going to affect how hard of a reed you can blow. Uh, lastly, your diaphragm strength will be tested here. I don't see, Michael seems to think that it wouldn't, but it definitely is because we're pushing that air with our diaphragm out through the reed. Now, the one thing it doesn't test is the strength of our arm. Uh, and I'm okay with that, right? Like for me, we want to make sure that reed is playable before we introduce the, the squeezing and the transitions. Like we want to make sure we have the strength to play enough of that reed with just our lungs before we add in the arm. Okay, so that's the scientific method uh, uh, behind that, right? The scientific method is everybody's different, but it's extremely difficult to measure or to find out in what ways that person is different because there's so many variables. So this test takes away those variables. Uh, and it's a great test. For example, if, you, if you're in a pipe band, right? Uh, like what I do in my pipe band is before I give anybody a read, I say, hey, play me the first line of Scott and the Brave on that. And we make sure that they can just barely get through that line uh, because if they can't, they're not getting that read. It'll be too hard for them. Okay. And meanwhile, if they can go past that point, like two or three bars past, obviously that reads too easy for them. So we want to give them something a little bit more robust. That one line tends to be the golden spot to determine what the correct strength read is for you. Yeah. I, I wonder, there's, um, <clears throat> there must be a limit to this test. So I think I would only add that maybe, maybe, and I'm just sort of shooting off the cuff here. There's no at, limit. At a higher level, a stronger person, like there, there's got to be a, diff, a, a more or less a range of the air capacity in our lungs. There's an upper limit to that. So at some point, I'm sure more advanced pipers or experienced pipers playing very hard reads for whatever reason they want to do that would have to breathe them more frequently because the quantity of air needed would be more than sure. that. So there's maybe some other theoretical upper limit here that would, as, as Michael asks, you know, require more blowing intervals because of a higher... I think but that's any... going to be like 1% of the population that plays bagpipes, maybe. Right. It's like, you know, you need to be at least six foot five to play in the NBA. But then there are rare exceptions, right? Right. There's the five foot two guy that scores a whole bunch of points in the NBA. You know, like every now and then there's a rare exception. I suppose that could be true here, but we're operating on the assumption that, um, you know, we're operating on the assumption that the Piper isn't like a superstar that's been playing for 40 years, I think, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, like, and, and also that we should have a natural, comfortable blowing cycle on our pipes as beginners and intermediates. We don't want to be hyperventilating to operate them. Let's just leave it there. Um, the test yeah. really works, folks. Like, do this. If you do the litmus test, the Chan Reed litmus test, plus the four steps of bagpipe maintenance, 
it is scientifically impossible for your pipes to be too hard to play. I think we'll get a chance to talk about this some more and further questions. So um, I'll just add in my 17 seconds that rest. Oh, you got a a timer going? You got a timer going? Um, You're fancy. I actually exhale extra air at the end of my blowing cycle. Like Probably because you play those easy French reads. (laughs) Um, Right. There's no, there's not really a, the need to use every ounce of air in your lungs. There's usually a little extra. Yeah, I agree. Cool. I, I, uh, in the perfect world, I agree. If I'm playing my band instrument, it's not always the case, but yeah.